morning. Again, we're in 1 Corinthians 5. The title of our message is Counter-Cultural Confrontation. It's one of those exciting topics that we all love. Confrontation, sin, repentance, and, and you know, I see the excitement in your face. And I'm excited with you guys. Counter-Cultural Confrontation. And the beauty of being able to cover a book like 1 Corinthians, it really uh, washes away all of the misconceptions that people may have of the early church. Uh, Many presume the early church was just this awesome, powerful, pure thing without controversies, without uh, conflict. And yeah, there's power, there's just amazing stuff happening in the early church, and you definitely get that impression as you perhaps read through the book of Acts, for example. But the epistles, like 1 Corinthians, like Galatians, like the letters of Peter and John, give you a window into the humanity of the early church. And to no one's surprise, at least I hope no one's surprise, it's Just as it is today, there's a church made up of people, and where there are people, there's conflicts, there's difficulties, there's controversies, there's corruption and weaknesses. But by God's grace, the way they do then is we do now, we walk in that humility, we we are covered in that grace, the the repentance that, that continues to characterize the church allows us to put hand to plow and move forward with love for one another and forgiveness that we receive from the Lord. So we recognize the Corinthian church, like many churches of their days and ours, uh, is, is, is messed up. And so Paul is addressing some of those issues, and, and we get to unpack a new one here in chapter 5. And it's one of those passages that deals with sin, but it's, it's unique from what we may typically be used to when it comes to passages dealing with sin. A lot of times, passages that deal with sin tend to focus on the individual level of forgiveness, repentance. Uh, You know, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We read about how Christ became a sin offering for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So all of this encouraging stuff that's really applicable on an individual level But this passage is unique in that it deals primarily not with the sin itself as much as it deals with the church's corporate response to sin within the fellowship. So if I haven't made that distinction clear, there's sin dealing with an individual uh, uh, um, on on an individual front, but also this corporate front that we're looking at here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. How ought the church respond to these types of issues, which happens then and it happens even now. So let's look at the first couple of verses. It says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather... To mourn, let him who has done this be removed from among you. So let's just break this down verse by verse. Uh, he, he starts off by saying it is actually reported. And it depends on your translation, but the, the Greek here can also be translated as widely reported. Not actually reported, but widely reported. Uh, one translation I saw says heard everywhere, as in the word has gotten around about this particular sin. Now, the, the church in Corinth, as we've already discussed extensively, had a number of issues, amongst which is huge, their, their spiritual pride. That's why all the tribalism, like, oh, well, I follow this guy, I follow that guy, I follow Peter, I follow Paul. And, and so this spiritual pride Uh, put them in a really rough and vulnerable position. It caused not only a lot of division, but a lot of blindness when it comes to viewing one another with clarity, particularly this sin that he mentions here in in verse um, 
in verse 1, where a man has his father's wife. It's a, a form, as, as Paul describes it, a form of, of, of sexual immorality, which was used by the Jewish community. It's a very specific word, but the, Jew, the Jewish community in the first century would use it to refer to basically any kind of sexual immorality outside of what God designed it for, which we, we see clearly in both the Old and New Testaments that intimacy is designed for a man and a woman specifically within the, the covenant of marriage. And anything outside of that is a distortion of God's design, and there is no exception. And this particular form of sexual immorality is so bad that he says that not even the pagans approve of this sort of thing. Non-believers don't tolerate this kind of sin. And you know things are bad when the church tolerates things that the world finds intolerable. intolerable. Uh, and we have uh, evidence for that in the ancient world. For example, Cicero saying that this type of sexual immorality was, was a, a crime unthinkable and unheard of and, and completely taboo. It was against both Levitical law and, and, and both Levitical law and even the Roman law. So even the Gentiles uh, were uh, staunchly against, against this sort of thing. And he describes it as a man has his father's wife. So the implication being that this man was sleeping with his stepmother. It's unclear if his father's divorced or deceased, uh, but it's something that is, uh, again, against both Jewish and Roman law. And the man is addressed here, but the woman is not even addressed. So the presumption is there that she's not even a believer. Uh, uh, and so we'll unpack more of that later. But he says that the, the response of the church is, is, is not good. And it seems to be the, the primary focus in this chapter. He doesn't talk too much to the man. He doesn't address the man too much, but mostly the church and what they ought to do in, in light of all these things. He says, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? That word for mourn is used for actual mourning, like mourning for the dead, mourning over the dead. And there's a, a, a few things I want us to understand going into this because, I don't know, when you, when, you, when you think of or talk about church discipline, perhaps we might get a little uncomfortable. It's not something that we're uh, used to, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a topic that even a lot of churches get wrong. They err on one side of the extreme or another, but let's... Uh, approach this with uh, uh, candidness and, 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 and biblical wisdom, uh, one of the things that we ought to observe with this is that this specific sin is not a one-time flub. It's not a, something that's being struggled with in, in the sense that it's, a, it's a, a, a fight that this man is battling. This specifically that Paul is referring to is an unrepentant sin, uh, a sin not repented of, not necessarily uh, uh, um, struggled with at all, but just completely given himself over to this relationship that's unbiblical and, and this lifestyle that's against God's word. This sin is acknowledged. It's publicly known. It's corrupting the whole body of the fellowship, and yet there is no repentance. What do we see instead of repentance? It's pride oh, well, you know, I'm the exception, or, you know, it's not that big a deal. And this is the opposite of how we ought to respond to sin on both an individual level and a corporate level. And Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. It says in verse 10, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So kind of in line with what he says, that you ought to mourn, grief and mourning is that necessary component when it comes to repentance. Because apart from that, we're either going to be A, blind to our sin, 
the pride that, that uh, so many of us <laughs> possess and, and, and is, leaves us vulnerable to being blind to these sort of things. So it will either be blind to it or the other option would be to just be comfortable with it, justify it somehow in our own corrupt rationale. In either scenario, there will be no repentance, no turning away. And so sin is allowed to do its work in corrupting the individual and destroying the life bit by bit. And he says, you're arrogant. Rather than being mournful, they're arrogant. Uh, uh, NIV says, you are proud. And I, and I, and I like that translation. And pride will solidify that sin into a normal part of life. It, pride takes a sin that ought to be repented of and says, oh, well, I'm the exception, or it's not that big a deal, or it's a problem for other people, but not for me, and they should just mind their business and, and let me do whatever it is I want. But godly grief, mourning over sin, gives us that clarity that sin is harmful, destructive to both us and those in our lives. And it doesn't lead to condemnation, I want to say. I mean, you know, we've discussed this before, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8.1. So that's not the goal. The goal is not to be condemned. The goal and the fruit of godly grief, not worldly grief, but godly grief, is that of repentance and, as is follows, healing and freedom and, and peace. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Sometimes we only think of this in the context of mourning over, over a loss or, or, or some kind of circumstance, but really, it's, it's blessed are those who mourn over their spiritual state, who recognize the desperation that they are in apart from Christ, and to receive Christ in, 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 in their repentance and, and turning away from the old and into the new. James, the epistle of James, chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, James writes this, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hearts, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. And that's not exactly the happy-go-lucky Bible verse that we always want to hear, but it's necessary, especially if a sin persists in our life. That the, the, the enemy has, has lied and said that it's okay or not a big deal or that you can contain it and no one will notice or no one will care. But God sees what no one else sees. And, and rather than allow our spirit to slowly decay and give over and give way to the patterns of sin, which result in death, we can turn. And as painful as that is, it's like, like ripping a, a, a Band-Aid off. I'm thinking about this right now because I got, I got a little eye boo-boo earlier in the week. I don't know if you can see it. Gonna, can our 4K camera pick that up? And, and then I put like a, a, a Band-Aid on my, my eye. And it was so close to my eyebrow that when I took it off, it just pulled out the bottom half of my, my eyebrow. I don't know why I'm thinking of this right now. Um, but to just rip it off. What a Barney Fife said, just nip it in the bud. It's so, it's so much more freeing than to allow that slow process of decay that produces death. It may make us feel uncomfortable and it may cause us to mourn and weep. And if it does, thank God. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. There's, there's comfort and healing when you finally confess and 
receive that grace and receive that forgiveness from the Lord. And if we do not deal harshly with our sin, sin will inevitably deal harshly with us. It destroys and it ravages even the people of God. Yes, we are saved by, by grace and not by our works, but even after we receive him, our task and our mission is to walk with him in this new life that he has offered to us. And so it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. And so that's the individual application is that we recognize sin and we don't hide from God or we ought not to hide from God or be proud and double down on those decisions or lifestyles. But we turn to him and receive forgiveness, we receive healing, we get back up, put hand to plow and to move forward. But on the corporate level, Paul has some pretty strong words to say. He says that this man, let him who has done this be removed from among you. This passage, I think, and as we, we're going to continue to read it and, and unpack it, but it bears similarities to the instructions of Jesus in Matthew 18. He says, if your brother has sinned, go to him, and your intention is not to cause further division or to push him away, but to gain your brother back. Because your heart is mourning for them and the disruption and, 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 and the the corruption that's being caused by their, their, their choices. And if they don't listen, you, you can read Matthew 18 if you'd like, but you bring one or two more, and then if they continue to persist, then you bring it to the whole church, and if they continue to persist, then, then you treat him as it says, a Gentile or a tax collector. They're no longer part of the fellowship. But even as a Gentile and a tax collector, that doesn't make, make them an exclusion of love as those are the people whom Christ came to save, the Gentiles, the tax collectors, the sinners, and those who can't, can't save themselves, which, lo and behold, is all of us. A very similar sentiment in 2 Thessalonians. Again, this is Paul. In chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, it says, If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Verse 15, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. And so again, the love persists even when very difficult decisions have to be made. When, again, it, it comes to unrepentant sins. I, I don't mean to say that if you struggle, you mess up, and you know we're not going to shoo you away if you confess and, and, and you're humble about it, but this is a, a proud heart that refuses to acknowledge the damage that's being done. And to continue on, it says in verse 3, For though absent in the body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan 
for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. These are some pretty strong words, and it's probably stronger than we're used to from Paul, who's typically quite gentle and, and gracious. And yet here he is rightfully exercising his authority as an apostle. And his words imply here that he doesn't have to be physically present to exercise that apostolic authority. His words and his letters carry that same weight. And we see this in, in here, the negative sense. We see it elsewhere in a positive sense. He says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 5, For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. But here we see a more negative example in which he is pronouncing judgment. Now we've talked about judgment when we were discussing uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 a couple weeks ago. So if you have any interest, you can go back to that if you want to know more about what the Bible has to say about judging others. But the bottom line is that there's a right and a wrong way to make judgments and discernments of other people. A lot of people gravitate towards what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, judge not, lest you be judged. And yet in the context of that passage, what Jesus is saying is that there's a right and a wrong way to judge, and that you ought not to judge others with hip, hip, uh, hip, uh, hypocritical standards that you yourselves are not living up to. If you're going to make a judgment, be prepared to judge according to the same standard that you are using to judge others. And Paul is doing just that. He is not making a judgment that he himself is not, is not living out, uh, but he himself is above reproach. There's a dangerous, dangerous, it's a dangerous thing to judge others while not examining self with humility and biblical clarity. And yet it's very easy to do very easy to do, to, to point the finger and to wag the finger at the shortcomings of others, and yet I might possess the same shortcomings or different shortcomings, but I've got good excuses for why I behave the way I behave, right? I've got a good reason why I, 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 I said that or, or got angry or, or did this or that. And so Paul pronounces a judgment, and he says, that he does so in the name of Jesus. When you are assembled in the name of Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan. So it's not, even as he pronounces his judgment, he's not doing it in the name of Paul, but in the name of Christ. That is to say, he is exercising his authority, but he's not going beyond what he has received from Christ, commissioned to do, to be a shepherd of the flock. And there's that statement in verse 5, which may confuse us or scare us. He says, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Uh, one other verse in the New Testament corresponds with this. It's in First. Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. He says, Of those who have shipwrecked their faith, verse 20, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And I would take note of that, that the, the goal is not for the destruction of their soul, not for their, their spirit to be cast off uh, 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 out of the kingdom, uh, but rather that they may learn not to blaspheme. Likewise here, the goal is not for the destruction of his spirit, but the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit 
may be saved. The destruction of the flesh, likely not referring to the body. There's some debate as to whether or not that's the case. We see in the book of Job that Job was under attack from Satan and it affected his family physically and as, as, as well his, as his own physical health. But I think the use of the word flesh here refers to the same thing that Paul mentions earlier in the book of 1 Corinthians is that sinful nature, that carnality that he possesses. I have a quote here that I want to read for you guys, and I'm not finding it in my notes. I bet you it's on my phone. Would you guys mind? Listen, don't use your phone in church. Um, it's by Alan Redpath. And he has a great explanation of this. Okay, I've got the quote here. It says, This man must sample the awfulness of sin, be cut off, if you like, from the imaginary halo of church membership that might enable him to go on in sin and think he was getting away with it. Let him be satiated with it until, like the prodigal, like the prodigal, he begins to be in want and cries out, I will arise and go to my father. So the goal here is for forgiveness and reconciliation. That's the goal of discipline and confrontation of sin. And, and so many times, rather than confronting what is clearly an unrepentant sin, We would rather compromise for the sake of comfort rather than com clearly communicate what is said in God's word. And as we, the church of the church as a whole walk in this calling that we've received from the Lord. We are not just people who are saved, but we are people bought with the price. We are people who ought to collectively have Christ as Lord and not just Savior, though he is Savior, not just friend, even though he is friend, but Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords. We're not really used to, we don't have a king, we have a president, and we have a government, and it, it, it functions much differently, but with a king, kings have absolute power, absolute say, absolute authority, And that's what Christ ought to have in the lives of his children, of believers. Then we're not looking for excuses. We're not finding ways to shortcut and allow a little bit of room for the flesh. We give the flesh an inch and it will eventually take a mile. It's like I don't understand people that want like wild animals as, as pets. I can barely handle my dog sometimes. But you see people with, with what do they call it, exotic pets, and the news, the, the news headline that, that, that cute and cuddly bear raised with family eventually plucks one of their heads off, or I don't know, just awful, but... You can't have a pet sin, and, and not only does it affect the individual, but it, it, it affects the fellowship. And so God forbid we would ever have to draw a hard line when it comes to unrepentant sin in the camp. 
but sin must be dealt with. Rather than the way that they choose to deal with it, it says in verse 6, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So in verse 2, he accused the Corinthian church of being arrogant. And in verse 6, it says that their boasting is not good. So it suggests that not only did they know about this man's sin, but that they were somewhat proud of it, that they thought that they were... And again, the context isn't really communicated to us all that well. Um, but it seems to suggest that they thought that they were being really tolerant, perhaps, or maybe saying something like, well, just look how gracious we are as a church. Isn't it so great that we're saved by grace, and so it doesn't really matter if this guy wants to, to do this thing or to live this way, or if any of us wanted to, to do something similar, and it, and it's, 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 it's a slippery slope when the message of the church is that God likes you just as you are and you don't need to change. Just believe, and as long as you believe, you can live however you like. Isn't that great? But that's not the truth. And, and this scripture makes it clear. It says in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Verse 2, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Verse 3, or have you forgotten that you, when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? That is to say, death to the old, death to the old life and the old patterns of living and the old cultural norms that says it's okay to do this or to do that. And, and believe me, the, the parallels are not lost on me. I, I don't do I have to spell it out for you, especially when it comes to sexual immorality and that, that the, the scope of what's okay and what's accepted is growing and growing in that definition being defined not by truth, not by ethics, but by the evolution of culture in that progression. And so the Corinthian church could have been like, well, just look how forward thinking we are. Look how accepting and tolerant we are. Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more grace? Absolutely not. Of course not. It's an emphatic no, or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ, you joined him in dying to that old life, being alive to the new things instead? I like the way the NLT phrases this. Have you forgotten? Sin is often a failure to remember a number of things a failure to remember the holiness of God, a failure to remember the lordship of Christ, that he is king over our lives, lord over our hearts, a failure to remember the new identity that we have received from him, that he has given to his children. There's a cyclical nature to historic revivals. They often come following periods of, long periods of moral decline in which the people of God finally stand up and say, I've had enough. The church 
not the world, but the church stands up and finally says, I've had enough of compromise. We've had enough. And turning to the Lord in humility and repentance. So we continue to pray and hope for revival that the church would stand up and say, enough's enough, enough compromise. He says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Being described as a lump isn't the most flattering thing. (laughs) Not inaccurate, though, as this gives us a sort of an Old Testament uh, illustration um, found in the book of Exodus, but also kind of if you know anything about this this process that leaven Uh, permeates the entire lump of dough. And so on an individual level, again, there's that application that if we allow sin room in the dough, it will eventually permeate the entire being. And and, and come on, listen, we all sin. If any of you guys don't, well, you're lying, so that's a sin, so I don't believe you. (laughs) We all fight our flesh on a daily basis. That's the reality of it. But especially, especially unrepentant, unconfessed, unaddressed patterns of habitual sin or, or, or um, carnal behavior, that stuff, it cannot be contained. Like the pet bear or the pet lion or the, the, or, 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 or the, the leaven in the lump of dough. It will eventually permeate and destroy. So that's the individual application, but the corporate application, sin affects the church. And and so many churches don't address sin, and eventually it's allowed to influence the entire body, again, out of fear of confrontation, fear of hurting feelings, or, you know, when sin is discovered or found out, people try to sweep it under the rug. There's a big cover-up. And, you know, you've probably seen that a handful of times with pastors or with leaders. And, and that's, that's a, a, a horrible uh, mis, misstep. And it's unbiblical. There needs to be repentance, especially as... Sin is public and, and proudly displayed or known. There needs to be humility and repentance. There can't be cover-ups. There can't be things swept under the rug. The leaven will eventually affect the entire lump. For Christ, our Passover lamb, or literally, for Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed. So all of this is in in reference to what we see in the book of Exodus and the Jewish celebration of Passover, which is in celebration of when the angel of death passed over the Hebrews during their time in Egypt as slaves It was the 10th plague that caused the death of the firstborn, but not to anyone who had the blood of a sacrificed lamb on their doorpost. And so Passover is a holiday celebrated even to this day, and it represents the freedom uh, from Egypt, freedom from slavery, uh, uh, and, and that freedom by way of the lamb being slain, their blood on the doorpost, all of that pointing to I think what is probably the obvious if you're a Bible student, pointing to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so after the Lamb was slain, for seven days, uh, they were to eat only unleavened bread, no leavened bread. There was no yeast allowed, not just in the bread, but not even in the home. All of it had to be taken out and removed from the, the, the home. Leaven in this illustration represents evil, which again permeates the entire entire body. So though Christ has been sacrificed on our behalf and freed us from the condemnation of 
that, uh, that would uh, our, our sins result in, but we are now free to live new lives in Christ. We are no longer defined by our past lives. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. All of that still, uh, but still remains the fact that we need to live this new life without the old uh, influencing us or permeating our being. If we are made new, why would, we, why would we go back to the old? Why would we allow those patterns to continue? That behavior, that sin. And worse than that, why would we boast about it when it's spiritual cancer and will eventually destroy? It spreads and it corrupts and it cannot be contained. It cannot be controlled. Let's continue to read in verse 9. Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people. Not at all, meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since you would need to go out of the world. But I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunk, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. So you, if you look at the beginning of verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral. And we've discussed this before. It's likely that 1 Corinthians is not Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Whatever he has written to them prior, we don't possess, we don't know what it says, um, and that's, that's okay. But it seems that he communicated to them that they should not associate with this these kinds of people, but the church in Corinth likely got this instruction backwards. What Paul meant was don't associate with those who claim to be a Christian, claim to be a brother, and yet continue to live in this lifestyle. And the church in Corinth, likely getting it backwards, stopped associating with the non-believers who continue to live in that lifestyle and, and thinking perhaps we're so holy, we need to separate ourselves from them. And Paul says, I was talking about Christians, not non-believers. If you want to get away from non-believers who, who, who live that way, then you're, you would have to go out of this world. It's almost humorous to me. You'd have to go to a different planet if you want to get away from that sort of thing. And, and, and so uh, recognizing that those are the people that, that um, we want to be won over to Christ this instruction is specifically not for holier-than-thou behavior or to be a, a sort of an exclusive club of believers only, but rather to, to for, the, for the fellowship to be something of, of above reproach. Those who claim to follow Christ and yet normalize greed, perversions, idolatry, should not fellowship with you because you're putting yourselves at risk and you're giving them the impression that the way that they're living is okay when it's really not. He says in verse 12, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge, God judges those outside. So even though Paul, again, is exercising his apostolic authority, he has no interest in abusing that authority as he recognizes he has no business in judging outsiders. The world is going to do what the world is going to do. That's God's job, his job is to eventually judge them. But Paul's job is to protect the sheep. Judgment begins with the house of the Lord. And all of this, again, with the hope and the prayer being that the church would get their act together and live the way that Christ has called them to live. All of us. And it's, 
and, and, and specifically in this passage, that brother who was brother or sister who has gone this route. The goal is not to make them feel unworthy or unloved. And we acknowledge that sometimes that's just how, how it goes when it comes to church discipline. When we think church discipline, again, we kind of squirm, we kind of scratch our heads because it's, it's, it's an area that a, a, lot, a lot of churches get wrong. I suppose one extreme would be to would be to not address it at all, and, that, and that's not helpful either. Because it allows the sin to persist and to continue and to corrupt. These aren't, I'm sure, I don't have to say this, but Paul makes it clear in his second letter, these aren't easy words for Paul to communicate. Because he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 and 9, in reference to this first letter, he says, Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy. Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended. And so we're not harmed in any way by us. Confrontation is sometimes necessary, but the intent is to make way for restoration, forgiveness, and healing. And though there's really no way to be sure if this man ever repented, it is possible if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In verses 5 through 11, Paul writes this, Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one... This punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, I have, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So here he's referring to an individual who was in sin, and it's affected Paul, it's affected the church, but now they're repentant. And so Paul, he says he begs them to reaffirm their love for him, to forgive and to comfort him. I read a quote by G. Campbell Morgan, and, and, and I love... I love what he has to say. He says, love never slights holiness, but holiness never slays love. You, you, if, if love forgoes holiness, it's not love. It's a perversion of it. If, if, if holiness is absent of love, it's, 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 probably, not love. it's not, probably not holiness. It's probably self-righteousness. And so the holiness of the church and the love that we have for one another goes hand in hand. It takes a, a stance on dealing with sin, but it does not forego love. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you. That you have called us
to walk with you. And not only have you called us, you've given us everything that we need to live life in you. Help us, O oh Lord, to walk in humility. To take seriously the call that you've placed on our lives. To not allow compromise. And to love one another enough to hold each other accountable. To be gentle and to be gracious with one another, Lord God. To, to, to so exemplify brotherly affection that as, as you have said that the world will know we're your disciples by the love that we have for one another. We thank you Lord for who you are and all that you've done for us that you are our Passover lamb that you have cleansed us of all the leaven. Give us grace and give us strength to walk in that. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.